Um, thank you, Vice Chairman. And um, you know, I haven't been here that long, but I have been in business a lot longer than I've been in politics. And it is, um, it's stunning to me that um, anybody that would claim economic expertise would say that messing with the full faith and credit of the United States of America is a responsible action. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling. And I'm, I'm going to make a couple comments here. There's been no major industrial nation that has ever gone through a significant default and recovered. I mean, Argentina did a decade ago. Maybe not a major industrial nation, but depending on the estimates, 40 to 60 percent of net wealth in that country disappeared in a few days, a few weeks. The analogy is back to 2011 when our first absurd actions around here, when, yes, perhaps the money moved to the, the, the T-bills a bit because uh, we looked only slightly less worse off than Europe, and we still had a few remaining bullets of extraordinary actions on monetary policy that have all been spent now. You know, the Fed acted today to extend one more time actions that you know, can only go so long because of our inability to do our basic job. We can't really ought to all get fired if we don't raise this debt limit. And I, again, I respect my colleagues and people on the panel who say we need to control spending. We absolutely do. And I've laid out a series of plans with Republicans and Democrats that make major changes to entitlements. But I find it stunning to me that there are people that think that this can be solved on simply one side of the balance sheet without looking at any historic norms on the revenue side as well. With an aging population, and even with the entitlement changes that are needed, any notion that we're going to be able to drive spending down to 18, 19 percent GDP with an aging population and increasing medical technology is so divorced from reality that it is, you know, it, it's not a budget that has, I think, again, much merit. I desperately think the challenge here has been, has been about how we find revenues. I think the New Year's Eve deal was a bad deal and a huge missed opportunity to do the more major economic entitlement transition and changes that need to be made, and the relatively marginal amount of additional revenue that's needed to be made. This is the thing that's so absurd. We took $4.5 trillion out of the revenue stream on the so-called Bush or Obama, because both parties are part of this, tax cuts. Nobody's talking about putting $4.5 trillion back in the revenue stream. Simpson Bowles, roughly about $1.5. Gang of Six, about 1.2. We're talking about putting about a third of that back in the revenue stream, along with major entitlement changes. That's a negotiating point that would be valid. I would argue, I mean, again, memo to Congress going forward, I would simply say, when we set up the so-called Budget Control Act, we set up, let's think of the stupidest thing we could do as a default mechanism to make sure that we wouldn't allow that to happen. It's called sequestration. And I would ask any of my colleagues of either party to come with me to NIH or come with me to Hampton Roads, where we have so many of our military installations, and see the cancer that is eating at the insides of both the people who are making long-term commitments to public service, our nation's readiness, or from a business perspective, the House budget which over about a 10 or 11 year plan takes domestic discretionary spending from 16% of spend when you can't count tax expenditures down to about 4%. I spent my career investing in businesses. I would never have invested in a business that spent less than 5% of its revenues on training and equipping its workforce, investing in its plant and equipment, which for our nation is infrastructure, and in a global economy staying ahead of the competition, which is R&D. And yet, that is our business plan at this moment in time. That is a business plan that I would have never got accepted. It was a business plan that, candidly, Mitt Romney would have never got able through, been able to get through Bain Capital. 
So I, I, I urge and I accept candidly the fact that a lot of folks on my side of the aisle have not been willing to go as far as we need to go on entitlements. Uh, and let's have that discussion. But anybody that says on any historic basis, looking at the past 75 years of when those five or six years when we've had balanced budgets, when those revenues have ended up between 19.5 and 21 percent, that somehow we're going to get back to a historic 18 percent revenue line that is going to be sustainable with anything approaching what ha the American people have come to expect is, again, divorced from reality. So I, I appreciate the chair and the vice chair holding this hearing, uh, but I guess uh, I would um, have to say, and, and you know, both sides bear plenty of blame, but the notion that the greatest nation in the world, with the dislocation in Europe, with China slowing down, with India's economy uh, almost grinding to about 4% growth, with countries like Turkey and, and, and Brazil that we saw as growing, with the uncertainty that we see, and I will acknowledge I have been a bit of a debt Cassandra. I know I've been called on my side. You know, we got through the debt limit. They didn't crash. We got through the super, so-called super committee. We didn't crash. We got through the stupid fiscal cliff. But I tell you, I think this time we're playing with fire exponentially greater without virtually any other tools to react. So my apologies to the panel that uh, I went past my time in the chair. Oh, it was more chair. than worth it. But, Thank um, you, Senator Warner. Uh, it was very good. Thank you. Thank you.